love the game. This is Love Set Match. I mean, Andre Agassi had this goal, you don't have to be better than everyone else in the draw when you go out on the court. Like, you have to be better than someone that's across the net. I think you've got to stay active in a sport sense, you know, go out there, do some sports. I think it always makes you feel better, maybe you're more tired in the mo very moment, but actually the rest of the day feels better. And then I think giving back as well, you know, making other people happy is going to get, give you a good feeling too. Welcome to Tennis Pal Chronicles, the podcast to feed your passion for all things tennis. And I am your host, Philip Kim, also known as Coach PK. I'm the tennis pro for the Langham Huntington Hotel in sunny Southern California and the executive director for the nonprofit Love Set Match. Hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year again. We did a podcasting in the new year first, but this is our second one. Super excited to talk about Australian Open, and with me today is my awesome co-host, Valerie Garcia. Hi, Valerie. Hey, Philip. How's it going? Happy uh, it's go Sunday. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Wow, what a weekend we have had. Let me first give a huge shout out to Tennis Pal, who sponsors this podcast. It's the best app to find people to play with. Visit TennisPal.com. And if you listened to our last podcast, you heard that they were thinking about closing, but they're they're going to keep it going. They're the little engine that could. So please visit Tennis Pal, sign up, uh, download the free app if you haven't already, sign up and start interacting. There's a lot of great free content there. There's a lot of ways to meet new people. So we want uh, Tennis Pal to go on and on forever and ever because it's just amazing and it's so important for our tennis community. Hallelujah. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> and if you'd like to support this podcast and the mission of our nonprofit Love Set Match, you can donate a tax deductible donation directly to our Zelle uh, using the email aces at lovesetmatch.org. Let's talk about the Australian Open. How late did you stay up last night? Uh, pretty late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, California time, it basically ran from 1230 to four in the morning, right? 430 ish in the morning. Yes, yes. I think uh, I've been struggling for the, this for whole the men's tournament. Final, yeah, actually, the women's final starts at midnight too. Basically, their uh, headline time is twelve or twelve thirty here. So the gotcha. whole tournament, all the main matches, start at midnight. It's been a rough two weeks. I've I've done the worst I've ever done in the in the history of watching the australian open <laughs> in terms of <laughs> being able to stay awake i've, I've fallen asleep so mid-match in so many matches <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome i i was online with some friends and you know we were all like yeah let's have a watch party let's do it you know uh, uh -huh. on twitter and stuff and by like 12 30 i was like oh man i'm tired <laughs> Oh yeah, I couldn't. Were, I couldn't hang. <laughs> were your friends um, American West Coasters, or are they all over the world? Some of they're them kind of all over on Twitter, right? But uh, one of the people that I talk to a lot, her name is Bon, and she actually she's usually in Australia, but right now she's in West Hollywood. So interesting that we were both trying to stay up, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and every time I want to complain, I think um, the rest of the year. Australians have to deal with this when they right. watch tennis. So, right. you know, I guess if we only have to deal with it for like three weeks, the first three weeks in January or the first month, let's just say, then and we should, I guess, count our blessings. <laughs> and the Australians are a tennis loving crowd, aren't they? A rowdy bunch. They love to share their passion for tennis. Yes, it is a great crowd. And, you know, I think a fair crowd. Um, a respectable crowd, you know, I feel like, I feel like there are, there are some tournaments and countries who I shall not name that can get, a, <laughs> can, then can get a little, um, testy, let's just say, or, you know, right. um, it can just get a different environment The the Australian open, I think is called the happy slam for a reason because the people are happy and they make a nice, happy environment for the players. And that's, that's lovely. And actually, I wanted to go this year, but I kind of made too many trips to England instead. So I'm going to, I want to go next year to the AO. 
And the AO is also really well known because it's so close to Asia. And so you have a lot of um, really excited tennis fans coming in from Asia. And this year, the women's final really got them super excited, right? Yes, it is the Asia Pacific Slam, right? Yeah, it's it's the one closest for them for sure. Although I think a lot of people just travel all over the world. But where do you want to start? Uh, do you do you want to recap some of the exciting stuff that happened? Uh, the most exciting matches. I'm obviously the Djokovic Sinner match was, in my opinion, huge. Uh, yeah, I would say that was probably the biggest headline of the tournament. It would be like if Nadal lost at the French. Right. Practic- practically, right? He's kind of made right. him, made himself such a favorite here. I mean, I think he, six years in a row, 33 matches, win streak or something crazy, you know? Uh, did you watch? Did you catch any of that? I did. I um, What happened was I was working on some music, actually, and then my friends started, like, tweeting me and stuff, and they were like, he lost the first set 6-1. <laughs> and I was like, what? Oh, my gosh. So then I had to, like, stop everything I was doing and, like, start focusing, you know. Unbelievable. Uh, the first two sets that he dropped were just very unlike him. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like, you know, Sinner just came out smacking that ball with very clear game plan and a, a lot of belief. Yeah. Wow. His confidence is so high right now. It really is. It's nice to see. There was a lot of chatter talking about whether or not this was Sinner winning or Djokovic losing. Obviously, it's a it's a mixture of both. But what was your feeling? Well, and and I, I mean, I felt Sinner won, right? Djokovic yeah. did come out and say that was potentially the worst Grand Slam match he's ever played. <laughs> um, or at least that he could yeah. remember. And he said yeah. it wasn't a very pleasant feeling to play that way. Right. And then he tried to say at the same time, I give credit, he did everything better than me in every aspect of the game. And I yeah. think it is that, is that Novak came out a little flat. Yannick was pedaled to the metal from the start and didn't give Novak a chance to make his way into the match. Um, I think it's a miracle he barely even hung in on the third set and somehow, you know, managed to squeak that tiebreak win. I'm pretty yeah. sure I don't remember because this is a few days ago now. Um, Yannick had a match point in that tiebreak. He had tie a match point, right. And yeah. he missed an easy forehand, I think. So he, you know, and I think he easily could have won that. So uh, props to him for not um, going away. But, I mean, Djokovic didn't have a break point the whole match. That yeah, to me that's insane. is pretty crazy. But I, I do think I say uh, Sinner made Djokovic play bad is, is my take on it. Um, what did you think? Yeah, hard to say that he made him play that bad, though. You know, uh, I feel like something was up with Djokovic in the first two sets, whether it's low energy, whether he was tired. There's all these Twitter rumors that he had COVID. <laughs> there's like, all, you know, all the conspiracy stuff. Well, he that was, was sick the entire tournament, you know, from yeah. day, since before the tournament. Yeah. Yeah, definitely something. He was struggling not only in this match, but in other matches where it was it was not dominant Djokovic it was not uh, I've won this 10 times you know what I mean uh Djokovic uh he, he something was up for sure and I don't know what it was and he didn't allude to it at all in the press he did say this was a horrible uh you know conference but I always think that like the range of players uh doesn't really come close to Djokovic's level Nadal's level previously Federer's level and now you're starting to see wow it really is increasing in uh, a Carlos and a Yannick people are getting closer to that level it's very interesting listening to Medvedev's uh, press release and he had talked about how uh, before Sinner was really in a place where he could uh, he, he would go for it he has a really strong forehand and some of his shots are like he would say 
top 10 as far as power and hitting Mm -hmm. but um a lot of times he would miss he would spray and he wouldn't you know keep it in because he was really going for it in that aggressive style and he just said that this time and in the more recent times that they've played he's been able to fine-tune that and keep the ball in at that very high level which is (laughs) scary (laughs) pretty impressive yes it is it is and and i do think djokovic did come in the tournament not at 100 percent. i might have even something said in our right last, something our last yeah. podcast and i definitely know i told all my friends like he's not winning i, I never thought he was going to win this tournament i just i could tell by the way he came into it and then the fact that he was sick and then he had the wrist thing and all the losses to center it just all the writing seemed pretty clearly on the wall to me yeah yeah um but i still you know you never count him out right because i feel like it's it's Djokovic, right? And it's the Australian Open. So you don't count him out. But I definitely wasn't that surprised. And I don't think he was 100%. But I do right. still think like playing bad, having COVID or not, whatever sickness he had, Sinner still had to go and win. Oh, and yeah. He, and he played his tail off. He played yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah. He never let Djokovic settle in. Yeah. Um, and get there because, and you know what? Fed played with mono for like eight months. So cry me a river. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Djokovic can play with COVID just fine. <laughs> uh, what I mean, was... he's, he's Superman, you know, he's got he the, is. he really does know and understand his body so well. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Obviously, no one will ever know. Right. And I mean, let's not forget, this is Novak Djokovic, who he won the three of the last four majors, right? So, I mean, in his mind, he's thinking, you know, he, I'm going for, well, it's not exactly the calendar slam, but really I'm going for four in a row. He hasn't been able to do that. So that's that's added pressure as well for him, right? And and it's also, I mean, and I think these are the types of matches Djokovic loses as well. Is It's the... Yeah. It's the Olympic year. He could have yeah. had in his mind that he wanted the golden, or yeah, the golden slam. Um, yeah. Right. And so that might have caused some internal pressure that we don't know. And I think yeah. in the press conference, they even asked him. I mean, I was, I heard he went into his press conference really quick and like right after the match, which is generally, you know, <laughs> you should maybe. Pull, chill out for a little bit before you go reflect but um and answer the questions <laughs> but he went in right away so i think he was you know he didn't really have a lot of time to to think about the match right. however they said I i'm think done they, I'm, I'm done yeah, yeah get me out of here uh they asked him if the, if he thought it, his age was a factor and if this was like the beginning of the end and he was he was like i don't know i i don't know time will tell right i guess we'll find out and right. so then there is also that, right? If if we do if we do see potentially that this is because he didn't say no straight off. Right. You know. And he did I mean he's 36 now and he's going to be 37 at the next slam. So, you know, time is so harsh for all of us. And uh what does it mean for Novak Djokovic is the big question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I know. So it definitely was I think the biggest headline and shocker, even though I, I wasn't necessarily shocked. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's still... I was shocked by the scoreline, though, you know? I mean, his inability to return serve, uh, which, you know, many people call him the greatest returner of all time. And I think that it also said something about Yannick's ability to up his service game because I think that was another area of his game that he's tightened He's been serving harder, uh, better placement, and, uh, you know, had a good amount of aces. Really, really exciting. And I think Djokovic did not serve an ace until the third set, which is really surprising. Yeah. Yeah, Yannick Uh, was returning really good. Really well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was interesting in the the interview right after the match, the on-court interview, Yannick was talking about his perspective on the match and, you know, he felt like he played really well in the first two sets and then he called the third set 
it was pretty even, he said. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, for him to look at it like that. And and he meant it not in a conceited way, but just like, wow, yeah, uh, maybe uh, maybe his level went down slightly, very not very much, but definitely Djokovic's level went up. And at that point, the level was even. And it was very close. I mean, that third set, uh, Djokovic had to raise his level. He had to do something. He, uh, he was almost pushing to, you know, get to that same level. And so that's why it was so close on the third set. Uh, other than that, uh, first, second, and fourth set, not even. Yeah. And you know what? I felt like it, there was an omen. I already thought he was going to lose. And then when this ha- happened, I said, oh, this is the kiss of death. And that was when the crowd decided to start chanting no lay. <laughs> <laughs> once they got on his side and it reminded me of the u.s open when he lost to daniel like i was like when the the crowd is supporting and and p- trying to pick him up and and love him you know and that that's yeah. not his uh motivator you know it's very nice and he loves it but that's not the thing that that we know Djokovic is unbeatable when he has an enemy <laughs> And you could also right. see it in his body energy. Like uh, he was very even the whole uh, match, right? Yeah. Even yeah. in the third set when he was trying really hard, he was hitting winners, but he was not celebrating. He was not like, come on, crowd, give me more. I mean, he did it on a couple of points, but in general, his energy level and his interaction with the crowd was very even. And that's not the Djokovic that wins, right? I mean, the Djokovic that wins is the one who really like – is yelling, screaming, ripping yeah. his shirt, you know. Yeah, point, pointing at his ear, you know. Yeah, for Calling sure. up someone. Yeah, he didn't He didn't have any of that, you know, right? vibe. Right, the angst, yeah. Yeah, none of that was there. And, yeah. you know, actually, when I was watching him, I remember thinking, like, it looks like he has cement feet, like mm. weighted shoes on, moon boots, mm. magnet shoes, I don't know, something. Like, he just was so slow compared to his normal self. Yeah. And that that is probably well he played a lot of tennis to get there because he didn't right. he didn't make his life easy the way that Sinner made his life very easy through the tournament. <laughs> yeah. And um, and poor poor Daniil Medvedev. Oh my gosh, how much tennis can you play? Right? And he yeah, he even said in his press conference that you know he he went out trying to attack right away because he knew that he didn't have it in him to yeah. go f- to play five sets. Um, and I think it's not just all the five set matches he had, but I mean, two of those recently ended, you know, ended so late in the night that he wasn't going to bed until like five or 7 a.m. Right. And just that just destroys your, your entire rhythm. Yeah. yeah. It's really bad. I feel like they, um, I feel like they really have a problem in tennis with these late matches and like matches starting at 11, 11.30 PM. Yeah. What sport does that? Mm-hmm. It's so, it's so avoidable. And do you think it, that plays into the whole super Sunday thing? And I mean, I thought that that was the idea was that they're giving more time by playing on Sunday. That's what they said, right? That's what their whole thing was. Right. They were saying it would <laughs> that they wouldn't have these late matches, but <laughs> they didn't they didn't do anything to change the they schedule. They didn't count on Medvedev. <laughs> well, yeah, and then they also, you know, um they schedule their night matches at like 7 p.m., I think. Which is if you're trying to fit two matches in at 7. And then if you if you put three matches on in the day and they run over and your night session starts at 8, it's just, it's just, you know, basic math. It's going to, it's going to happen. And they have, yeah. they have enough courts. Although I did hear um, on, I think it was like on Reddit or maybe it was Instagram comment. Uh, someone was saying that the Australian Open only uses 10 courts, whereas, you know, all, all the other majors have anywhere from like 15 to 25. Huh. That's interesting. And so that's why, you know, uh, they have to try and like squeeze so many matches in a sh- smaller amount of courts. I right. haven't re- I haven't researched to check the fact check that though. 
I'm going to do that next year when I'm there. I'm going to walk around and see how many courts are. Are you are going active. for sure? Oh, I have to. I have to. Um, wow. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be tricky, though, because uh, I actually have a wedding to go to in Australia. Oh, Janu- okay. January 4th. So then that means I'm going to have to be out there for like three weeks, which is fantastic, but also that, tough, you know? That is a long time. Yeah. That is a long, <laughs> it really is a long time and that can add up quickly. So let's see, I'm going to have to send up a, set up a GoFundMe or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you'll broadcast from there. That would be amazing. So oh, if yeah. you want, if you want Valerie to broadcast from the AO, yeah, start yeah. donating now. <laughs> yeah. Send it send it to Love Set Match. Um, Zell. It's tax deductible. That's put, right. And put, a put in memo, the subject letter. Val, exactly. Memo AO 2025. No. <laughs> That's right. Wow. 2025. That's incredible. That's crazy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, well, since we have a short time with me um, today... Do you want to? I'd love to hear what you thought about uh, Azarank- Azarenka, Sabalenka, and and um, Zhang Xinwen. Yeah, I really wasn't super excited about that. Um, you know, ever since uh, Rabakina lost, <laughs> I was like, yeah. well, on the women's side, I'm not super excited. Um, I I I was excited that there was an Asian player playing in the final. But it just, you know, all the stats that kept coming out that she, that she had never beat a top 50, you know, in this uh, in this um, tournament. And she never really faced anyone at the level of, you know, like an Iga Sabalenka. And it just felt like a foregone conclusion, you know, super Cinderella story. Could it happen? Yeah, maybe tennis is a crazy sport. But, you know, Sabalenka was on fire. And so, yeah, I wasn't super excited about that match. How about yourself? Yeah. I I feel the same. I guess I was hoping that uh, because she had actually battled through a a few um, three set matches to get there and obviously not against any top ranked players. But um, and then with the whole it being 10 years since Lena had won. Right. uh, You know, you start thinking like, well, maybe there'll be some magic. And then who knows? Right. Arena could get nervous right and it could just get tough right and boy Uh, does she get nervous yeah yeah so i thought uh, there was potential for it to be you know who knows but yeah yeah. something but (laughs) but i if i had money you know to bet i obviously savalenka was uh giving nobody any reason to believe yeah otherwise that's why i kind of like it was so sad that our girl ribacana went out so early and and that Oh, the longest match tiebreak in slam history. It was like 36 minutes or 31 minutes, something like that. Yeah, and you feel like in those kinds of matches, I mean, the server almost always wins, right? Uh, Isner, even though <laughs> yeah. his was even longer, but his, uh, usually this, I mean, on a tiebreak, your serve becomes your weapon. So I was really surprised she didn't serve herself out of that. Yeah. It was really sad to see her go out because I did think she was she was the favorite in my eyes. I I thought after her form in um, Brisbane, there was no reason to think that she she wouldn't go deep. You know, right? And and surprising again that Ega went out. So I felt like this whole tournament was kind of like these uh, and and off, oftentimes the AO is because it's the beginning of the season you you're testing out to see how you're feeling as you're starting mm-hmm. your new season but lots of really strange losses uh you know people um coming out of the tournament and it just was surprising to me yeah not enjoyable yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was I was personally not very surprised with Ega just b- based on her draw and yeah. also the fact that she's she's not really not um, a hardcore specialist, <laughs> hardcore right. specialist like right. Daniil is. Um, if if it was clay, if or a slower like Indian Wells, I think is a slower court um, yeah. these days. Anyway, I would give her more of a shot. But I I guess I just didn't really blink that much that she went out. But there were so many seeds went out. Yeah. In like the first round, second round, third round, dude, they were just dropping like flies, especially from that top half. Right. Um, the right. fact that we got Zheng Xinwen in the final is actually kind of was like a saving grace. Yes. Uh huh. 
Yeah, um, it kind of made it cool, kind of made it fun, and it was really exciting to see. And also, I think, for the rest of the world to find out about who she was and how great she plays. And, yeah, they even used the word destiny in one of the on-court interviews, you know, yeah. talking about, or no, I think it was a press conference, but, you know, is this destiny because Lee Na and you are connected? And it was just like, wow, that is such a harsh like <laughs> expectation to put on someone right and I, I love her answer she said uh well it's destiny when it when it happens and then when it doesn't happen i don't believe it's destiny <laughs> yeah right i love that because that's that's how i feel too <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely fate until it's not you know <laughs> yeah i mean she has a really great attitude and she's still young so i feel like this hopefully this is um and she's a likable gal you know great game i liked her game she reminded me of Iga the way she was her defense sliding around um yeah. and and such a strong core being able to hit like great shots from from the corners um yeah. and she i i hope she like can more like a sabalenka in the way that she hits though right i mean very strong Yes. Uh, not not like I feel like Iga is really tactical, super smart in the way she can move people around and everything. Uh, not as much power, a lot more spin. But wow, uh, I just feel like she can take somebody's legs out super easily. Whereas Sabalenka and stuff, I th I feel like those two are just hitting each other off the court. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. I think I just mean like a defense wise, her movement. Oh yeah. Her yeah. her like athleticism to me seemed really up there. Like I was yeah. really impressed with how she was able to move out of those corners. Yeah. And I do she has a good serve. I know those double faults I think really was hurt. Yeah. I mean, that's there's no way you're you are already up against it with arena. Right. You start right. you double fault five times. In a, in a matter of like 10 points and you're totally, you're very much 100% going to lose. But she had one game where she smacked like four aces in a row or like an unreturnable and then three aces. Uh, very Federer-like. Yeah, nice. it was great. Um, and I think she she she's young and there's room for improvement and there's a lot to be excited for. So I can't wait to keep watching her uh, develop yeah. and I hope she can, you know, just be another person to enjoy on the tour. Well, Valerie, it's uh, it's your hard stop I, time. I so. see, I see. <laughs> my little, my little alarmy just went bing, bing, bing. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we're, we're gonna ha we're gonna continue this podcast with Martin. Uh, Martin's calling in from the UK, and thanks for setting that up, Valerie. It's super awesome, and I know Martin has a lot of insight about Yannick and uh, just the whole tournament in general. So I'm just gonna connect with him right now, have him join the call. And Valerie, thank you so much for making time and I hope you have a super great weekend. Thank you, you too. And uh, say hi to Martin and I, I will be looking forward to hearing your chat with him. <laughs> okay, take care. All right, bye. Hi guys, we're back and I am super excited to have Martin Keaty back on the show. Uh, as you guys remember from the last podcast Martin was on, he is so good at um, analyzing and expressing his experience of tennis and I really enjoyed talking to him. Martin Keaty obviously writes about tennis, including tennis history for Last Word on Tennis. Um, some people call it LWOT for short. And he's based in London, and his work can be found by searching for Martin Keady, K E A D Y, uh, or on as an author on uh, LWOT. And of course, you can find him on X at uh, M R T N K E A D Y. Uh, I still call it Twitter, Martin. <laughs> I think they should and call his... it Twix. I mean, that's the obvious rebranding, <laughs> isn't it? And your website, of course, is the shakespeareplays.com, which just sounds so good. I've got to come up with a better website name for myself. <laughs> Please welcome back Martin Keaty to the Tennis Pal Chronicles. Martin, we almost met. It was so close. I was very excited to be in London and uh, was really trying to make it work. And I'm so sorry it didn't. I, I'm, I'm equally sorry we couldn't meet up, uh, Philip. And thank you again for that very comprehensive introduction. Uh, very much appreciated. It's lovely to be back. And it is wonderful to have a chance to talk about another great major. There's so much to talk about. Where do you want to start, Martin? 
Well, Yannick is the obvious starting place, I have to say. A first-time major winner and in one of the great comebacks. Um, I feel desperately sorry, as I'm sure most of the tennis world does, for Daniel Medvedev because to be two sets up again in an Australian final and again lose, uh, as he did to uh, Rafael Nadal two years ago, it must be heartbreaking. Nevertheless, Sinner showed absolute champion quality to come through in one of the greatest, uh, as I say, one of the greatest five-set fightbacks in major history. It's probably right up there with Rafa's two years ago, to be honest, and that's why it is such a shame that both happened to Medvedev, who is himself a great player. Incredible player, and uh, I apparently now has played more uh, time in an in a Grand Slam uh, in one session. Is that correct? Over twenty-four hours, I believe, is what the stat was that would make sense i hadn't seen it i knew it was over 20 hours so factoring in today i'm afraid my maths is absolutely abysmal <laughs> philip but that that sounds about right and unfortunately for medvedev it probably was the deciding factor he was yes fantastic yes. for two sets and it, yes. it appears obvious in retrospect, if not at the time, that he thought, I've got to win this quickly. I can't go five, six hours again. Whereas Sinner, who had played less than half the amount of time going in, knew that if he could take it long, as most writers had predicted, I myself had said that if he if he could take it long, then there was every chance that Sinner, sorry, I beg your pardon, that Daniel Medvedev couldn't stay with him. And obviously that's how it panned out effectively. And you have to kind of feel like it's revenge or that Zverev is looking at uh, Medvedev and saying, welcome to my world. <laughs> well, it, it's there are so many issues with it. I mean, it does unfortunately tie into the big negative with Australia, which is scheduling. And Medvedev played one of those ridiculous, they're not late night, they're middle of the night matches. I believe he finished one match at 3.40 a.m., it was in the earlier rounds, but there's that can't be good for a tennis player. Everything I've ever heard from tennis players and coaches and most importantly physios and trainers is that you will have a knock-on effect with disrupted sleep for several days. It may just be that the cumulative effect of spending so much time on court, which is obviously down to him, you could easily say he should have won his matches more easily. That's how you cut down on time. But this scheduling factor, it just can't be dismissed. Australia is a great major, but they got to do something about the scheduling. Yeah, he had talked about going to sleep at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, in his press conference. I mean, it, 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 it's absurd. I mean, there are numerous simple ways of fixing it. Start the, start the, uh, you know, the day earlier. I mean, it just... But you can't have players, as I say, I'm, I'm certainly not a scientist. I don't know what the effect would be, but it, it, it shouldn't be there. It was almost inevitable that Medvedev would lose today because going into the match, having played twice as many, twice as long on court, I was trying to explain it to a non-tennis friend. Um, and I used the analogy from the Football Soccer World Cup. Imagine if the two teams who met in the final one of them had played effectively two more matches on the way to the final, the fatigue will inevitably catch up with you, as it did with Medvedev today. What was really interesting, though, e even though we all somewhat felt it was inevitable, Medvedev took it to center in the first two sets, and it really looked like he was going to win. I mean, it's one of those fascinating um, speculations that we tennis lovers love to indulge in. Um, there's no answer, ultimately. That's why you can indulge in it endlessly. Whose peak is the greatest? You know, if every player was playing at their peak, I would suggest that Daniel Medvedev playing at his absolute peak, which would necessarily involve him having spent much less time on court than he has in the last two weeks, there are few, if any, players better. I call him the magician, a poor pun, but he is magical. <laughs> he it. is on every level just remarkable i mean the biomechanics don't seem to work and yet he is clearly a great player he seems to combine great serious philosophy with flippancy i mean he is wonderful he is unique and i really 
do hope that he can win another major soon because, you know, I, I, I don't know this off the top of my head, but there can't be many players who've only won one of their first six. And admittedly, he's been playing great opponents in, in all the other five, um, but still, it has got to be really devastating. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of the number six, it was interesting that uh, early on in the head-to-head, he had beaten uh, Yannick Sinner six straight and just more recently, unfortunately, lost the last three. And I heard Jim Cur- Jim Courier talking about how in the locker room, when there's a three-in-the-row kind of progression, you really feel like you own the person because the you know maybe the one off okay you just let it go two there's a pattern here but three really seals the nail in the coffin so interesting that Sinner was able to turn that head to head around uh, chronologically. It's an interesting theory, but with all due respect to the great Jim Courier, it does contain its own counter argument if it was the case that you won three in a row and owned someone then Daniel would have doubly owned uh, Yannick having beaten him six times in a row I think it's more a tribute to Sinner's remarkable upturn in form really over the last three or four months not even six months Um, yes yes you know obviously most people only really tune in for the majors where tennis is concerned but we net heads follow the the tour all year round and it really was I think it he's so interesting Sinner we'll talk all about his backstory his fascinating upbringing all the different cultural and linguistic elements but um, I would just say personally I do believe that this uh, this first major victory and those to come it was made in Beijing last autumn fall where he beat Medvedev for the first time in the final after six straight losses and even more importantly he beat Carlos Alcaraz en route to the final and what a match that was it was Insane. an extraordinary match and um and and I think the combination of beating it's is what you have to do to win a major. You have to beat great players back to back to back. And it's the consistency, the most boring but important word in sport, the consistency of doing that. And that was, I'm racking my brains. I think I think that was the first time he'd beaten two top five players at the same event, including one that Medvedev he'd never beaten before. He's virtually been unstoppable since Beijing. He, he won in Vienna. He withdrew in Paris because of another late night scheduling. Obviously, people, tennis players don't like it. He beat Novak in the group stage at the um, uh, end of year finals, the ATP Tour finals. Novak beat him in the final. But then you had the miracle of Malaga, as I called it, the Davis Cup win, where he beat Novak Djokovic, the GOAT, at least statistically, and he beat him in twice in one day in singles and doubles. That was phenomenal. And you know that Novak wanted to win for his country so badly. Uh, I absolutely. I mean, uh, as as you kindly said, uh, Philip, I do write about tennis history. I love the present, past, and future, but I have a particular soft spot for tennis history. And of course, Novak attributes a lot of his success to having won the Davis Cup with um, Serbia for the first and only time at the end of. 2010 he had won a major before then the 2008 Australian Open but he hadn't backed it up and it didn't look it didn't look remotely possible he would go on the kind of the decade of domination or domination you might call it for the last 10 15 years nearly and one wonders if the, the same pattern might repeat with Yannick he virtually won the Davis Cup single-handedly beating Novak en route and and the very next the very next tournament just as Novak did in um, 2011 he's won his first major so those who decry the Davis Cup should bear in mind what it can do for players because it's often said you're never under greater pressure than playing for your country and so if you can come through that then when you go back to playing for yourself it's inevitably less pressure and you can cope with it better. And it seems like, in general, this very nebulous idea that I have is Novak really struggles when in that kind of pressure, playing for Serbia, I I think of the Olympics where he's really struggled. Um, There's something about the pressure of playing for his country that puts him in this really strange headset, is what I think. Uh, That is is, um, possible. I mean, obviously... 
he has done well for Serbia, winning the Davis Cup, albeit a long time ago, and he hasn't been able to repeat with them. Um, you're right about the Olympics, although I think that was... It, it, <laughs> It's strange, of course, that another Olympics year is coming around so soon, but that's because Tokyo was delayed and and we all know why, because of COVID, but everything was compressed then. So, um, I I mean, it's he, he certainly hasn't done as well playing for his um, country as he has done playing for himself. If you, you know, 24 majors versus one Davis Cup, and he did win the, as I believe, the ATP Cup a few years ago, in 2020, I think it was, or maybe 2019. So he has won um, tournaments. I, I would never question Novak's ability to withstand pressure because I don't think any player has ever withstood pressure in his life better than Novak. I, I, I may have said to you, Philip, that the way I always looked at the big three was if you wanted a player to play for your life, it would be Novak. If you could only watch, <laughs> if you could only watch one player for the rest of your life, it would be Roger. And if it was, if the tournament was on clay, you would obviously take Rafa ahead of either of them. So, again, forgive me if I've said this before, but it is such a perfect analogy. There was the great boxing book about the four kings, the great middleweight boxers of the eighties: Hagler, Hearns, Leonard, and Duran. Well, we've had three gods three sporting gods in Roger, Rafa and Novak. And um, it's only when, and it, I'm sure it's still a long way off, it's only when Novak finally retires that the big three, and Rafa, of course, although he's had far more injury problems, that we'll be able to assess this extraordinary golden age that we've lived through for 10, 12, 15 years. Yeah, you were talking about Yannick's um, run against the top players, and I believe he's now upped it in this um, series of time that you had described, uh, his his rise, his ascendancy. He, I think, is now has beaten 10 of 11 of the last matches against top five players, uh, which is phenomenal It's now uh, that he has beaten Medvedev, yeah. Yeah, well, it, uh, forgive me interrupting, Philip. Um, the the difficulties of transatlantic communication, even on you know modern technology. But um, yes, and the exception in that run would have been Novak in the ATP Tour Finals when right. uh, Novak. I again, I've written that I I often think he's the king of revenge tennis. You never beat him twice. <laughs> Rarely, if ever, do you beat him, but you never beat him twice. And that's why it was it, it, that's why it was so remarkable that Yannick beat him twice in one day. Admittedly, yeah. in singles and doubles, but that's the only way you could play twice in one day. And um, and and as I wrote before the final, I obviously thought it was going to be close. Daniel Medvedev is a great player, a major champion. You can't make six major finals without being in the super elite of players, which he is. Um, but I did think that um, Sinner would come through. I just thought that the improvements both in his game technically over the last year and then in his morale and confidence and self-belief over the last three months, I thought that they were going to be a very, very difficult combination to beat. I didn't imagine it would go to five sets and that's huge credit to Daniil but um, Yannick is what he's always seemed to be for those of us who've been watching him for the last five years he looked like a major winner just as the big three looked like uh, major winners when they first appeared even at 18-19 yeah and as unorthodox as he looks like you said he has become the med uh, magician uh, maybe escape artist in this tournament <laughs> but I'd love to get into uh, Yannick's history because I know you've done some in-depth research. And one of the things that I find fascinating about uh, Yannick Sinner is that he's from Italy. And usually there's that, um, you talked about the boxing kings that really push themselves. And I think about the Swedes in their golden era where there was players that all rose at the same time that really pushed themselves internally and then allowed them to dominate on the global stage. I think it's fascinating that Yannick doesn't have that in Italian counterparts. Well, he does and he doesn't, as it were, um, Philip. I'm not trying to be overly enigmatic. He has, in Lorenzo Mazzetti, the um, the other previous golden boy of Italian tennis, who must be wondering what's happened in the last six months. <laughs> uh, Lorenzo Mazzetti is a former world number one junior. He... At his best, at his peak, 
he's proven it. He can he beat um, Carlos Alcaraz when Carlos Alcaraz was just coming through, but already looking unstoppable in the Hamburg final. It's just over 18 months ago, summer 2022. And at his best, Musetti can beat anyone. He beat Djokovic in Monaco this year. However, he he um, he is currently on the downward elevator, even as Yannick is ascending into the stars. This is the challenge for him now to respond to this. If Yannick can do it, he can do it. Yeah. Beyond them, there are a number of other fine young Italian players. I mean, Italy, which has always been fairly, fairly tennis crazy, as judged by the number yeah. of tournaments it holds. Up until today, it had only four um, four major winners ever, two men, two women. And so Yannick is only the fifth, which is extraordinary when you consider the love, uh, the general love of uh, tennis in Italy, the rich history of Italian tennis. Um, but certainly in comparison with Spain or France, it's been a, a relative minnow, but that will change. But I really hope, I, I, I am... Uh, 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 I'm very old-fashioned in some respects, um, Philip. I try to keep up with technology, but I'm old-fashioned in the sense that I love a single-handed backhand, which uh, Lorenzo Musetti has. At its best, it is as good as the great backhands of uh, Henan and Federer. He isn't always able to play it, but that's why I'd love him to fight back, and I do hope he'll respond to this positively. I hope so, too. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Yannick's development and uh, his rise? I'm, I'm very happy to, partly because I've been looking back over previous articles I've written about him over the last, it's really four years, four and a bit, bit, bit years. The, the brief summation, as it were, and I will try to be brief for once, um, he, he really broke through in the winning the next gen tournament, the tournament for the best under 21 players. Um, at the end of 2019, that long ago, far away, mythical land before the pandemic, which, um, you know, almost seems, it does seem mythical now. Anyway, Yannick won that tournament in Turin and I saw all of it. It was extraordinary. I remember Chris Commode, who was the, um, I think it was the outgo, he, he's a legendary British tennis organiser. I think he was outgoing chairman of ATP at the time and he was interviewed right. and he said that he had never seen a he'd never seen anyone of Yannick's age certainly hitting the ball as hard and as cleanly that kind of that whip crack that bullet that the very best players have and he won that tournament and then as so many of his contemporaries found out he entered the world of Covid tennis which was I mean, in, in some respects, it might have been easy because it was new for everyone, but it was a very weird, a very weird time. But he proved his credentials. He reached the last eight at the autumnal, autumnal uh, Roland Garros in 2020. It was obviously relocated from the spring because of COVID. And he won his first ATP tournament in Sofia at the end of the following season. And then what was really interesting is the emergence of Carlos Alcaraz. Yes. And he is younger than, um, he's about two years younger, roughly, than uh, Yannick. And his rise was so spectacular. He won the next gen, the next next gen, as it were, in 2021. There wasn't one in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. And within a year of his winning the next gen event, he had won a major, the US Open 2022, and in the process become the youngest ever world number one. And so I wrote two years ago in the summer of 2022, would um, would Yannick emerge from Carlos's, gi Carlos's giant shadow? And it was wonderful to repost that article today saying emphatically, see, yes, he has. And I think with the two of them, they... Um, they, it, I mean, it seems obvious. I hope it will happen. I think only injury would prevent it. But they look like being the next great rivalry of men's tennis for the next decade. Yeah, it, um, and I do think of them as really pushing each other. And they've talked about that in, in press interviews, uh, really taking that to the next level. And I feel like you need that in tennis. You need that kind of camaraderie. And of course, I assigned it to um, internal country camaraderie. But uh, for Yannick, it does seem like it's Carlos Alcaraz and, uh, uh, yes, Lorenzo. That makes a lot of sense. 
Um, but he has really being challenged and, and his uh, development, I wonder if it's Darren Cahill as well, just talking about his ability to keep uh, hit as hard as he could, but with less errors now, right? Keeping the ball in and, and just still having the same amount of pace. And even Djokovic was talking about how hard he was hitting. I think Medvedev said, you know, he, he was in the top five of uh, how hard he hits, but before he could count on errors. It, I mean, it, it, so many things to discuss there. I mean, Yannick, it is that power hitting. That was the first time I, I saw him when he was um, about 18 when he won the next gen. And it was, you know, you most 18-year-olds don't hit the ball like that. Of course, within a year or two, you've got one who seems even better in Carlitos, Carlos Alcaraz. And it is fascinating. It's the great contradiction of sport, not just... Um, not just tennis, Philip, that we all want to win, but actually what we want more than anything is rivalries. We remember the great rivalries, not the dominant champions who were so good that they beat everyone else. To me, that's how I feel about Pete Sampras, certainly at Wimbledon. He was virtually unbeatable for the 90s. I mean, he lost one match in eight tournaments. It was incredible. No one could really push him. So, it's the great rivalries, the great rivalry we've just had of Novak, Ra Roger and Rafa. Before that, the great historical rivalries like Borg, McEnroe and Yannick and Car Car Carlos, I'm sure, will follow in their illustrious footsteps. And you're right, they push each other on. It's, uh, you know, all of the big three have acknowledged it. All the other players I mentioned acknowledged it, that when you have a rival... Even, and thankfully it doesn't often happen in tennis, unlike, say, boxing, you, they rarely actually physically hate each other, but they are rivals and they spur each other on and they admit they would not be as good without the other person. It's this, you know, in sport, you really do need other people, however good you are. Yeah, it reminds me of Federer's uh, rise as well, 2000, well, the er, the early 2000 teens, uh, 15, and then his dominant year 2016 and it and then Nadal comes along and really pushes him and he has to change his tennis his change his style uh definitely saw that in that rivalry in which some people consider the greatest rivalry of tennis well I personally I it's not easy because it's not a straightforward rivalry but I do think of it as the rivalry the three-sided rivalry between Federer um Djokovic and, and Nadal. to have three and the three best ever at the same time. I don't think that's ever happened in any other sport. It certainly hasn't happened in tennis history before. That's what made them unique. But um, however, I, 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 you can blame me, Philip, because I love to talk about tennis history. Getting back to the Aussie Open today, I'd love to talk about Arena Sabalenka's win at all as well, if that was possible. Absolutely. Let's get into it. Well, of course, that there are great similarities between the two. I mean, already Arena is firmly established as Iga Svantec's biggest rival, and this will only increase her self-belief. I mean, and there are comparisons as well in that, um, at least to the naked eye, um, Yannick seems to be the hardest hitter on the men's tour, and that certainly seems to be the case with Arena on the women's tour. She is, again, I remember seeing her first emerging again in the year of 2019 when she first really began to win tournaments. And again, you just marveled that it was someone hitting that the ball that hard that wasn't Serena. Up until that point, it was only Serena Williams who could hit the ball that hard. Serena inspired a whole generation of women to get better. That was her influence. But it was amazing. Yes, it was a very disappointing final, unfortunately. Jung is a very good player, but she was obviously hit by nerves yesterday. And in her case, she'd unfortunately had too easy a path to the final. She hadn't right. played, I believe she hadn't played a, a player in the top 50 before she got there. And then she faces uh, arguably the number one or joint number one, statistically number two in the world in Sabalenka. And it was almost too much. Right. And I think on the women's side, you have to include Elena Rybakina, even though she didn't make a dent this tournament. I mean, I feel like she is right there as far as rivalry with Sab Sabalenka. If and I, I'd like to talk about how 
uh, yeah, after Serena, it, it inspired this whole generation of women. I think of Yastremska. I think of Annie Samova. Uh, they all came and started, uh, I, I don't know if coaching changed, but they all started hitting super clean, super hard, very fast. Uh, Sabalenka was part of that. Uh, Rabakina was part of that. It's so interesting that there was this evolution of how to hit the ball on the women's side that that exploded to this point now where it's just insane how hard they're hitting. <laughs> well, and equally with the men. I mean, this is, having talked about tennis history, you know, tennis present is pretty spectacular now. I mean, obviously on the men's side, as we were discussing, you still have Novak as the world number one, but even Novak has now just, dis- it's it, the great joke that I'm sure people saw on online or on social media when he lost that, um, the you know, the only unbeaten champ ever is time time it gets everyone in the time wounds all heals as they say and even Novak this absolute superman who is now 37 fast approaching 40 even he has got to slow down eventually but um but getting back to Sabalenka she is clearly um hugely um motivated and bolstered by the self-belief from winning the major last year she said that at the time it gave her so much confidence and we're seeing we're now seeing on court the uh arena sabalenka that that previously you'd heard reports of from other players this wonderfully infectious her speech yesterday was one of the few truly great you know winners speeches it was very very funny indeed and very just memorable Yes, she's very witty, that's for sure. Unfortunately, <laughs> oh, I fear that the speech was more memorable than the final, but that's the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that speech uh, at the last tournament where she lost and she said she could not thank her team and everybody was laughing. And <laughs> she was telling <laughs> Elena, don't thank her team, don't thank them. <laughs> I mean, it was fascinating, you know... It, when she said, of course, they're not as good without me, it's true. I mean, again, it's the old joke, and it probably is one of the oldest jokes in tennis. What's the what's the quickest way to become a great tennis coach? Answer, find a great tennis player. And, um, <laughs> you know, That's but, but it's, it's always more, com- <laughs> it's more complex than that, obviously. The great player, the truly great players do acknowledge the role that various people will have had in their coach. It was very, very affecting to hear... Um, Novak talking about his tennis mother, one of his earliest coaches, whose name, embarrassingly, I I forget now, but it was the phrase, the tennis mother. You know, all of these great, even the greatest players will have numerous tennis mothers, fathers, uncles, and and the coaches are vital. Look at the, you know, look at the impact that um, Darren Cahill has had on Yannick Sinner. Equally, the counter, you know, the other side of it is Arena has a very stable coaching team with whom she's been... um, you know, they've all been together for a number of years. There's clearly the tightest links between them all. So um, coaching coaching matters, Philip. We know this. It's absolutely vital. Yeah. Was there a favorite match that you had on the WTA side? Maybe Coco or uh, uh, Iga going out? or Well, going even... The thing about majors, of course, by the end, by, by the two weeks that, you know, the tournament ends... By the time the tournament's over, you've virtually forgotten the first few days. So on the women's side, it, <laughs> it was the astonishing tiebreak uh, right at the start of the tournament between Ribakina and and here's even I'm racking my brains for the name of her opponent, which Blinkova, Blinkova, Anna Blinkova, and it was the longest tiebreak in um, in major history, and that in itself is 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 remarkable. And it was such a great match to go to a a match tiebreak. It, it was very interesting. There were a number of match tie breaks right at the start of the tournament, and um, they, yeah. they obviously decreased as time went on. They are the ultimate. Um, they are the ultimate kind of shootout, I suppose. And there's no going back. I always think for a major final, you should go to twelve all, like you did with Novak and Roger in 2019. But it's clearly going to stay as the match tie break now, and I can see why. Well, they always blame it on television, right? It's hard for television. Yeah, very interesting tournament. I'm very excited for Yannick Sinner and what it means for the future of tennis. Uh, Carlos and Yannick and uh, Lorenzo and and a lot of young players. I I feel like Alex Dimonor really had a great showing and has been really hitting on all fours as well. 
Alex de Menor has had a tremendous start to the year, breaking into the world's top 10, which I'm sure many people would have thought wasn't possible. I mean, in the we're in the age of the giants mainly. I mean, particularly when Zverev plays Medvedev, as they did the other day. But he is, you know, he's interesting because he's, in de Menor's case, he's the classic classic Aussie grit, you know he will fight to the end, but his education, tennis education, was largely in Spain, so he's technically really good as well. So a Spanish-Australian combination there. He's had a very good start to the year, and there are other players. I mean, of course, at the end of the tournament, it's the winner who you largely think of, but there have been other players who've really had very, very good tournaments. And it, I, I love the Australian Open. For me, it's the start of the sporting year, not just the tennis year. And uh, I suppose ideally it might be relocated at another time of the year. But in a sense, it's best. It, it opens the year with a bang, literally. I mean, it's you've got to get up to speed immediately. And it will be, it will be fascinating now to see what happens in the next few months. Carlos Alcaraz will have to respond to Sinner. Igor Svantec will have to respond to Sabalenka. All the other players will have to raise their levels. Novak will have to raise his level. And, and I really hope, I really hope every tennis player, even the most devoted Fed head, I'm sure would hope that Rafa can make it at least to Roland Garros. It would seem extraordinary that he could win it. But if anyone could, it's him. But he should certainly be playing there one last time at least. Yes, I'm so excited to see Rafa play again. It was a disappointment to have him you know, enter and drop out. That was really uh, very sad. It's uh, it's a great shame because it's. I think we've all learned in the last few years what what has set him. What set they're all different. Obviously, what sets him apart from the big three in one respect. He's so he's so much more susceptible to injury and serious injury, which he's had when he won the two majors. In fact, when he won the Australian Open two years ago, I think he finally opened up about how effectively he'd been in, in considerable pain his whole career. His leg is an unending problem, and then all the other aches. And you know, he has. We want to see him play because we want to bid him farewell. He is. You know, he will always be the the go talk, as it were, the goat on clay. It's almost impossible to see anyone getting up to fifteen in the future. I mean, that really. <laughs> I mean, it could theoretically it could happen, but he's set the highest bar imaginable. I think in sport, not just in tennis, on you know fourteen titles at Roland Garros. I mean, that's on the men's side. I think Borg won six. I, there may be earlier players in the amateur era, but there's a big gap. So. We want to see Rafa back. We hope he can be there. And then, of course, uh, Eager has made Paris her own personal queendom, as it were. She'll look forward to getting back on the clay and, you know, seeing her up against Sabalenka and Ribakina, who, who you were quite right to include. If there is to be a rivalry in the women's game, it's those three. But equally, you then have Coco, who will be emboldened by her US Open win and Ons. Ons is a whole other podcast on its own, but when when it gets to grass, <laughs> when it gets to grass, she will definitely be a real contender. So, you know, it's um, it, it, the tennis calendar is not ideal, like most sporting calendars. The shame is now that it will be another few months until we have another major, but hopefully, it will be an absolutely wonderful one. We a wonderful major when we get there, and and en route, we will see all these players all around the world, obviously, because tennis is so global now, um, building their games even as they're trying to win. And that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah, and we're talking about the speed of the ball. Uh, what is amazing to me as a hack tennis player is that the fitness in order to keep that ball in the rally is doubly as important as being able to hit the ball uh, and just the level of physical fitness uh, health nutrition uh, the, the the consistency of the body I don't know how Daniel Medvedev does it it was just insane but it's it's not only the speed of the ball and being able to hit but you've got to get it back yeah I mean it, it is Obviously, as a nethead, I'm biased, but I try and back up my bias, biases with evidence, as it were. I do believe that tennis is the most physically, it's the most demanding sport, but that's why it's also the most rewarding. The way I describe it, and I think I think this is largely true, that to win a major, you need the endurance of an ultra marathon runner 
the physical dexterity of an Olympic gymnast and the hands and mind of a genius. It makes such demands physically and mentally. That's why it is, I firmly believe, certainly the greatest individual sport in the world. I quite like golf, but it doesn't compare nor skiing nor boxing tennis is the greatest individual sport because it makes such demands, but in return yields such rewards. Martin, I think you just gave us our caption. I mean, I'm going to make that into like a YouTube story because I, I love how you just described my favorite sport. So that was incredible. Very nicely Well, put. that's very kind of you to say so, Philip. All I would say is I feel like it's stating the obvious. I mean, I know... Um, all sports learn from each other now. And and I suppose the endurance is the one that really gets people. It's a long time ago now, um, but the famous John Isner, Nicola Mahu, um, the 70-68-68, the 70-68 final set in 2010, which finished three days after the match. They subsequently changed the rules, and rightly. But I know that there were, for example... NFL coaches who were citing this as the ultimate example of endurance. How do you play for three or four days? You know, wow. how do you keep how do you keep going when Daniela Hantachova had a lovely phrase the other day? Um, I think it was Daniela. I apologise if it wasn't, but with these marathon matches. She said, you almost forget why you're trying to win in the first place. You know, it's, you're so <laughs> you're so physically tired. Um, and, it, it, and, and, and I would just add, it's it. Now, the majors are the only five-set uh, format in tennis. Even the Davis Cup, which was five-set, has um, now gone down to three-set. And that's probably all OK. In the past, I don't know if she's so vociferous about it now, Billie Jean King has said that the men should play three sets as well. And they do in every other form of tennis about tennis now but not in the majors it must remain five sets if it doesn't we will not have these epic matches if it was a three set match daniel would have won within an hour and a half today epic right. epic means a great journey over time and it's the time that's the fact a time for plot twists and as i've said to you before the great the great majors, the great major finals like today, and it was a great one, um, If even if at the end Daniel was obviously tired, they're like great Shakespearean dramas, great five-act dramas, five-set dramas, and I personally believe nothing compares to them in sport, in the whole of sport, for the, for the unique demands made on the individual. I don't think anything compares. Love it. Love it. And it is sad that uh, our, not only is our attention span decreasing, but our ability to perform at that level it seems to be <laughs> decreasing as a population. And so it makes these people even more godlike that they can do it. Well, that's a very that sadly is a very good point. And that's, again, another whole other podcast, the in <laughs> increasing stasis of most of the population from which I can't completely exempt myself compared to these superhumans. <laughs> but um, no, they, they, they are absolutely remarkable. And one thing that also strikes me, and you as a coach would find this, I, I techniques and cert certainly biomechanics are not my forte, but I like basketball as well. I love basketball. And in tennis, as in basketball, you are making continual sprints and that's why you have the joke that you sprint a marathon over the time right. you will run a marathon but in short sprints it's so physically draining it's so physically demanding at least in basketball you have constant rotation in tennis you don't so um yes i i bow to, i bow to no one in my ad admiration and adoration of these extraordinary extraordinary players who are absolute physical phenomena but also i believe at their best have the soul and spirit of artists and magicians wow well it sounds like we have a wonderful and long uh, enjoyment of the best sport in the world ahead so really looking forward to it maybe just touch on the two uh players on the wta side that i really enjoyed watching uh mira andreva had a great run and talking about owns jabur i think she credited her as her hero and actually kind of said i patterned myself after her which i don't see at all but i thought it was interesting that she said that um was able to you know beat her 
Hero, which is one of those landmarks. And then, of course, the run from Yastrzemska was really stunning. And again, such clean hitting, such amazing contact, and uh, the way that she strikes the ball is stunning. Well, if I could just talk about Yastrzemska first, Philip. Um, yes. her, run, her run was obviously extraordinary. Marie, uh, Marta Kostyuk did very well, and... and uh, Svitolina, I'm sure, would have done well, but obviously had to withdraw. And we talked earlier about the importance of playing for your country. Well, no one is playing for their country like the Ukrainian sportsmen and women around the world, who I believe, from everything I've read, many of them have offered to return to fight or help in some way, and they've been told effectively, no, we want you abroad, keeping it in, keeping the story in the spotlight. I mean, war fatigue sets in inevitably and tragically. Tennis is as good a reminder of anything of what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. So for all of those Ukrainian athletes around the world, and I'll just briefly mention, I'm sure you know as well, um, Philip, having said that, the, the, the form, I mean, I hope he's still OK. Uh, uh, Sergei Stokowski, the tremendous former player in the past, he is on the front lines there. So it's, impo- you know, it, it must be unimaginably difficult for uh, the Ukrainian athletes. And I don't blame them for often sort of failing to comprehend or why the, wor- why the world is still going on. They, they all have family still in Ukraine. Um, Tennis players are extremely wealthy, but even they probably can't afford to get every single member of their extended family out, even if they could. So um, Yastrzemska, as I say, and Kostyuk as well, close behind, truly noteworthy. Um, uh, let me add, also add Alexander Dagopolov. Uh, also, uh, I remember watching him play in such an interesting style, but he's on the front line as well. Well, it, it, I mean... <laughs> That, that's not another podcast. That's another, you know, mini TV series, epic film, epic drama. I mean, that really is, um, again, I bow to no one in my love of tennis, but anyone who loves tennis or any sport knows it's just a game. Compared, to, It's a wonderful escape from the reality of life. I have the utmost admiration for, you know, those who can fight for their country. I mean, it really is extraordinary. And for those players who would probably have had the opportunity not to do it they they it's truly admirable um getting back martin let me just throw in because this is a perfect transition that we as a nonprofit are actually trying to rescue a family uh, of a tennis player a boy who's 11 years old his name is georgie from donetsk uh, oh wow Ukraine. And there's actually this really great program that uh, allows us to apply for his visa, uh, the family's visa, to come out of Ukraine. You've got mail. Um, it's called Hope for Ukraine. And so we're in the process of trying to rescue that family and have them come. And you can go to our website and our Instagram. You can see pictures of him playing and, and practicing and performing when it was better days. But unfortunately, yeah, that's uh, something close to our heart as well. And I just wanted to give that a shout out uh, while we are talking. If people want to help support this family and, and their transition to America, I really hope that we can be a part of that story. Uh, Philip, you should You've have uh, said that right at the outset. And I'm sorry I've been, waff- <laughs> I, I'm sorry I've been waffling along when that extraordinary <laughs> well, <laughs> human story there. And, you know, very, I obviously wish you the greatest luck. It, it, I mean, it's, I mean, it, 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 it it is the most ridiculous thing ever, with the possible exception of boxing and I believe certain other sort of mixed martial arts that, you know, talking about sport as war or sport or, as, or sport as life or death, it, they're not and they shouldn't be. It's not and it shouldn't be. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I wish you the best of luck with that young player. And, you know, and by all means, you should be shouting that out at the end of the podcast as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I didn't mean to interrupt your Yastrzemska uh, coverage, but really exciting to see her just come in. And you did feel like she was going to run out of gas because it was such a shock that she was able to go as far into, you know, uh, the as a qualifier also to go so far into the major. It was amazing. And, you know, for a time it looked possible that she could, um, you know, do a Raducanu, as it were. I mean, Emma obviously is coming back herself from injury now and the fact that she could play 
even in the in the tournament was great. But um, your strength's got a remarkable run, and she did run out of gas at the end. But it was you know remarkable. And briefly referring to the other two women, you mentioned uh, Mira Andreva is clearly extraordinary, sixteen still, and now looking like she could be a contender on the clay court circuit, and maybe even at I Rome. love her game. And so and good. and I will just mention on Chabert. I, I was writing the other day, I'm sure this is true, that she must be the most universally loved um, and adored tennis player since Roger Federer, and probably even more so, because obviously she reaches so much... Uh, I mean, she lost early. She hasn't traditionally done well at um, Australia, but um, I fear Ons is just playing under so much pressure now that it's almost mm. impossible for her to play her best. It's, you know... You what you need pressure is a privilege, as Martina and Billie Jean King said. But too much pressure inhibits players, and especially players as marvelously instinctive as Ons. And uh, we say that players carry the weight of um, the world on their shoulders. Well, Ons, being the supreme human being that she is, she seems to carry the weight of at least two or three worlds. She carries the weight of the Arab world, and she carries the weight of the African world, and she carries the way of the women of those two worlds as well, not to mention her all her admirers around the world. And and I recently heard, and I believe this is is true, not not just gossip, but a, you may be able to concur, it, it was widely reported, that she was particularly uh, depressed and disappointed after losing Wimbledon last year because apparently she had been planning a, a, a mid-career break for her and her husband to try and start a family, as a number of other women have been doing. I believe Ons is about 28, 29 now, so she'd considered it. And because she didn't win Wimbledon, she felt unable to take... And I would, as I'm sure many other wiser and certainly you know more professionally able and skilled people would say, it, it, she's got to find a way of getting out from under the pressure. It's too much pressure for any one human being. She is a wonderful player, an even better human being, and I just wish her the best, regardless of whatever happens on the tennis court. Wow, yeah, that, I didn't know about um, the try with her husband. That's very interesting. It's obviously something, Definitely. you know, I, I hesitate even to mention it. I believe that's true. I, it was certainly reported being reported, and w we'll move on from that. But again, just to say, we wish Ons all the best, and we hope that, in you know, as I say, a little less pressure would be good, I think. <laughs> right. Probably for well, all Martin, of us. Uh, yeah, for all of us, that's true. <laughs> uh, mental health is is that really important subject for all tennis players. And, and we're actually trying to apply it uh, for the kids that we teach in our nonprofit as well. Speaking of that, Martin, I've got to get back out to the court pretty yes. soon. So I just really enjoyed, love, love talking to you, hearing about your perspective of tennis and really hope that people will follow you on Last Word on Tennis, uh, a great website. And Martin, of course, shouting out from London. So great. I hope we get to meet again in London someday. I hope I get to get out there. Anything else you want to share with us? I know that you're excited about so many things. Um. Well, I will just mention it briefly, actually, because we have been talking about um, human, more human stories at the end of right from Ukraine to the story that you cited yourself. I will just very briefly mention, I was talking about this with Philip before I came on, if anyone's listening to this podcast, you really should go and see The Holdovers, the new film by Alexander Payne. It's a masterpiece. I don't know if it was nominated for the Oscars. It doesn't matter. It's just a masterpiece and actually I'd said to Philip I might refer to it during during our chat and I merely mention it tennis is actually mentioning it once so I can justify it referring oh there to you it. go <laughs> and it's, it's that's the tie-in <laughs> and even that sort of throwaway remark is typical of a brilliant brilliant script and a a colossal performance by Paul Giamatti it's sort of a sequel to Sideways in an end in the end but it's even better than Sideways wow fabulous film that's why it's been such a great day to have a great tennis major in the morning, a major final, and then to see a great film. Few days are as good as this, Philip. Well, there you go. You get it all on the podcast. Uh, 
the passion for tennis. Uh, you get a movie recommendation, <laughs> and hopefully a very enjoyable time spending with Martin, myself, and Valerie. So thank you again, Martin. Really excited to talk to you soon, and uh, really excited about Valerie's uh, epic schedule and trying to put us on track to talk about all of the professional tournaments that are coming up at at least the thousand and the Grand Slam. So really hope that you'll be a part of those. Well, I certainly hope to, Philip. Thank you very much again for um, having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk tennis. And as I said, these you should release a separate sound bite of your pod about the young boy from Ukraine because that is by far the most important thing in this podcast. Thank you. Will do. Thank you guys for listening. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you want more information, please go to lovesetmatch.org. And if you want to follow Martin, please follow him on Twitter as well as on Last Word on Tennis. So we would love to hear from you guys. Send us an email or a shout out and we'll talk to you guys soon. May all your serves be aces. 